I am so excited to be able to introduce one of my favorite writers this evening, Kazuo Ishiguro. Um, his precise language, thoughtful exploration of character, and his ruminations on the notion of subduity and memory and so many more themes make his novels truly unforgettable. And I often find myself still thinking about his characters, from Stevens and the Remains of the Day, to Kathy and Never Let Me Go, long after I've left their worlds and returned to my own. His new novel, The Buried Giant, is his first novel in a decade, and it takes readers on a fantastical journey across misty medieval Britain, following an elderly couple as they face strange and otherworldly hazards in their quest to reunite with their son. Neil Gaiman writes in the New York Times Book Review, The Buried Giant does what important books do. It remains in the mind long after it has been read, refusing to leave, forcing one to turn it over and over. Ishiguro is not afraid to tackle huge personal themes, nor to use myths, history, and the fantastic as the tools to do it. The Buried Giant is an exceptional novel. Mr. Ishiguro will give a brief reading this evening, and then he'll be interviewed by our own Andy Cahan, the Ruth W. and A. Morris Williams Director of Author Events here at the library, and then there will be an audience Q&A afterwards. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Andy and Kazuo Ishiguro to the Free Library. Oh. Thank you. What, what a very warm welcome. Thank you so much. Um, um, and thank you for coming in this snow and everything. <laughs> I, well, I we thought we'd welcome you with the Philadelphia Spring. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're going to start with a little reading? Yeah, I yeah. think that'd be ideal. Okay, so, so I think that the format is that I'm not going to read um, anything kind of very special. I'm just going to read the opening three pages of, of, of the new novel, just so that when Andy and I are, are, are referring to the new novel, I mean, you've got, you got some, something in your mind, you know, assuming that most of you haven't had a chance to read this. Uh, so I'm not making any great claims. This isn't a stunning passage or anything like this. <laughs> it's literally the first three no uh, pages. So it would, it would just be a few minutes, and then we're going to have a... Nice chat, and then we're, we're hoping that people are going to, some of you will then have some questions, and we can have a, have a sort of a, um, a nice uh, communal kind of a discussion. Yeah, I forewarned him that it's a smart audience, so you yeah, have, yeah. you've <laughs> got to live up to it tonight. <laughs> okay, so, um, so yeah, before we, okay, so this is chapter one of, of the new, of my new novel, The Buried Giant. You would have searched a long time for the sort of winding lane or tranquil meadow for which England later became celebrated. There were instead miles of desolate, uncultivated land. Here and there, rough-hewn paths over craggy hills or bleak moorland. Most of the roads left by the Romans would by then have become broken or overgrown, often fading into wilderness. Icy fogs hung over rivers and marshes, serving all too well the ogres that were then still native to this land. The people who lived nearby, and one wonders what desperation led them to settle in such gloomy spots, might well have feared these creatures whose panting breaths could be heard long before their deformed figures emerged from the mist. But such monsters were not cause for astonishment. People then would have regarded them as everyday hazards. And in those days, there was so much else to worry about. How to get food out of the hard ground. How not to run out of firewood. How to stop the sickness that could kill a dozen pigs in a single day and produce green rashes on the cheeks of children. In any case, Ogres were not so bad, provided one did not provoke them. One had to accept that every so often, perhaps following some obscure dispute in their ranks, a creature would come blundering into a village in a terrible rage, and despite shouts and brandishings of weapons, rampage about injuring anyone slow to move out of its path, or that every so often an ogre might carry off a child into the mist. The people of the day had to be philosophical about such outrages. In one such area, on the edge of a vast bog, 
in the shadow of some jagged hills, lived an elderly couple, Axel and Beatrice. Perhaps these were not their exact or full names, but for ease, this is how we will refer to them. I would say this couple lived an isolated life, but in those days few were isolated in any sense we would understand. For warmth and protection, the villagers lived in shelters, many of them dug deep into the hillside, connecting one to the other by underground passages and covered corridors. Our elderly couple lived within one such sprawling warren, building would be too grand a word, with roughly 60 other villagers. If you came out of their warren and walked for 20 minutes around the hill, you would have reached the next settlement. And to your eyes, this one would have seemed identical to the first. But to the inhabitants themselves, there would have been many distinguishing details for which they would have been proud or ashamed. I have no wish to give the impression that this was all there was to the Britain of those days. That at a time when magnificent civilizations flourished elsewhere in the world, we were here not much beyond the Iron Age. Had you been able to roam the countryside at will, you might well have discovered castles containing music, fine food, athletic excellence, or monasteries with inhabitants steeped in learning. But there is no getting around it. Even on a strong horse in good weather, you could have ridden for days without spotting any castle or monastery looming out of the greenery. Mostly, you would have found communities like the one I have just described. And unless you had with you gifts of clothing or food or were ferociously armed, you would not have been sure of a welcome. I am sorry to paint such a picture of our country at that time, but there you are. To return to Axel and Beatrice, as I said, this elderly couple lived on the outer fringes of the Warren, where their shelter was less protected from the elements and hardly benefited from the fire in the great chamber where everyone congregated at night. Perhaps there had been a time when they had lived closer to the fire, a time when they had lived with their children. In fact, it was just such an idea that would drift into Axel's mind as he lay in his bed during the empty hours before dawn, his wife soundly asleep beside him. And then a sense of some unnamed loss would gnaw at his heart, preventing him from returning to sleep. Perhaps that was why, on this particular morning, Axel had abandoned his bed altogether and slipped quietly outside to sit on the old warped bench beside the entrance to the warren in wait for the first signs of daylight. It was spring, but the air still felt bitter, even with Beatrice's cloak, which he had taken on his way out and wrapped around himself. Yet he had become so absorbed in his thoughts that by the time he realized how cold he was, the stars had all but gone. A glow was spreading on the horizon, and the first notes of birdsong were emerging from the dimness. He rose slowly to his feet, regretting having stayed out so long. He was in good health, but it had taken a while to shake off his last fever, and he did not wish it to return. Now he could feel the damp in his legs, but as he turned to go back inside, he was well satisfied. For he had this morning succeeded in remembering a number of things that had eluded him for some time. Moreover, he now sensed he was about to come to some momentous decision, one that had been put off far too long, and felt an excitement within him, which he was eager to share with his wife. So that's the first three pages. <laughs> you don't have to applaud that. <laughs> it's very kind, but it's just, it's just the opening. <laughs> so before we talk about the momentous decision that launches the narrative, I wonder if you could tell us why you chose to set this book in the Iron Age, or if it chose you. Well, mm, yes. Well, I, I might have to actually you know, start to answer well, the, 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 the next question that you said we were going to leave for in trying to answer that first one. Um, I started off 
I started off um, actually thinking about um, writing a novel set in some more contemporary setting where there had been a recent trauma. Like, you know, uh, um, I, I was actually thinking actually of you know, the disintegration of Yugoslavia in the mid-90s and the Rwandan genocide. And also th the other thing that was happening around that time in the 90s, you know, South Africa, in, in, in a positive way, South Africa had managed to come out of the period under apartheid and avoid civil war and major conflict by very carefully balancing the need for that society to remember all the terrible things that had happened under apartheid and deliberately forgetting, to some extent, the horrors of apartheid. They did this very deliberately through, the, to, through what they call the Truth and Reconciliation Committee. And I, whereas Bosnia, Kosovo, Rwanda, they seem to be examples where people had managed to coexist. The different tribes, different groups had managed to coexist quite peacefully for at least a generation or two. And then for some reason, some kind of violent societal memory had been awoken um, of what had happened, you, actually in the case of, um, case of uh, uh, Bosnia, you know, what had happened in the Second World War. And one side, in the middle of the 90s, you know, turned on the other. Uh, the, the, they had been living in the same villages. They had been using each other for babysitting. And suddenly, they were burning houses, hanging children. Uh, it, it was, it happened, I mean, we were living in Europe. I mean, it happened absolutely on our doorstep. You know, this is a place where, w w where British people used to go on holiday, you know, for vacation and so on. And so it was a real shock. And uh, I had wanted to, I wanted some kind of territory in my, in my fiction that talked about how societies, how nations remembered and and forgot things about their past. You know, when was it better to remember? When was it better to forget? Um, and so that's where I started. Okay. But rather than, after a while, rather than write a kind of a reportage novel, a, a kind of a documentary kind, kind of novel about one of those places I just mentioned, for instance, you know, um, I felt that wasn't my strength. You know, that, um, uh, some people would write a great, important novel, but I didn't, I didn't really want to write that kind of a novel. I didn't want to be s sitting here with you today discussing the details of what had happened in Yugoslavia as it disintegrated in the 90s. You know, that, that wasn't my particular obsession. I Did just you begin that novel, though? Or no, I never play? began. I, I, I often have this situation where I, I have an idea, I have a story, you know, I have a plot and I have characters and relations, but I don't know where to set it down. I, you know, and here, here was a prime example of this. But I wanted, I wanted to set it in a, in a, in a setting, and in, even in a genre, if you like, that was more distant from these actual things, so that people could, my readers could be invited to apply it to all kinds of situations that have occurred throughout history. You know, it's a, so we end up with something that feels a bit like a fable. But I, I would wish people to say, actually, you know, we know many situations like this today, and actually this pattern has been occurring throughout history. It's not so much a pattern as a kind of a question that I think um, people have had to grapple with. Um, and I'll, I'll, you know, I don't presume to talk about the country that I'm in at the moment. I'm a guest here, and uh, so I don't want to, I don't want to you know, make any suggestions about what what the um, United States has decided to remember and forget about some dark passages in your history. But I think almost every country, certainly Britain, you know, France, Japan, you know, any any place you care to mention, I think before long you realise that there are uncomfortable things in the in the past, the recent past, and there has perhaps been a very good reason to say. Well, for the moment, maybe we should re suppress that memory. On the other hand, there's a very good argument to say suppressing that memory is just going to lead to never-ending wound, uh, a wound that will never heal in our society. And, that, and so, that, so I wanted a setting that, that, that seemed almost like a mythological setting. You know. 
But essentially, that, that's what it's about. You know, when, when is it good to remember? When is it good to forget? And you've got two lead characters who sort of embody that in Gawain and in, um, and in Axel, and in Beatrice as well. I mean, it's something that a lot of the characters are grappling with. But I wonder if you could circle around and say what that momentous decision is, and then through that momentous de decision, if you could give us just sort of a brief arc of the story so people know what they're in for, but mm -hmm. doing it without, there are just so many revelations in this novel. <laughs> I guess the, those of you who are laughing know. So if it's possible to do it without spoilers, I'm not going to try it. Oh, I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not very good at this kind of thing. Um, you know, I sometimes wish we, you know, that we authors could do what, what people do in the movies, you know, where they, you know, the trailer, kind of a movie trailer, where they just flash up lots of things out of context that don't kind of that join up, and then it finishes, you know. Uh, but we're not allowed to do that. We always have to kind of give a logical, kind of clear kind of thing, you know. Um, well, we can uh, go to another question. No, 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 I'll, 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 let me try, okay. All right, well, well, let me answer it a slightly different way. I mean, because I was telling you thematically you know, where I was coming from and the problem I was having about, you know, how do I mount this idea? Let me tell you from a kind of story, a plot point of view. I, 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 the way I tend to, li I, I like to work by um, having a kind of an idea for a, a storyline that I can more or less express when it's right in two or three sentences. Um, in fact, I, I, I must confess, I do have a kind of a notebook where I write, scribble down possible projects. And I like to think that unless you can actually, I can actually articulate the central idea in two or three sentences, quite simple sentences. And, and unless I can look at these sentences and I can feel a real power coming out of it, you know, that, that the thing is more than the sum of the three sentences, that there's, a, there's, a, there's some very powerful emotion coming out of these three sentences, that, that makes me think, oh yes, yes, I mean, and that's, um, I can do all kinds of things with that. I mean, in a way, I kind of feel you should be able to write down two or three sentences and you, you when you look at them, you might, you might even want to cry. You know, it should be that powerful. You know, and then I feel I can uh, I can start thinking about you know how to mount it, where, where where to go with it. And in this case, the the kind of starting point, story wise, was that I wanted some situation where an elderly couple uh, found themselves living in a in a country where everybody was suffering from some kind of memory loss. Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not referring to any kind of dementia to do with their age. In fact, paradoxically, the older people seem to remember better. But it's a, it seems to be a very selective memory loss. Um, there's a kind of a mist that has descended on the, on the countryside, and people often kind of have strange blanks about what they were doing even that morning or even the previous hour, you know, um, particularly when it seems to touch on certain kinds of areas. Um, so I needed that situation. Um, th there's, there's a problem about memory. And, and so this elderly couple um, have to face this question because for them, for their marriage, the shared memories are very important. And, um, and they, they think, well, what would happen to our love for each other if we, if we can't remember things about our life together? Um, you know, and, and I get, I get the, the, the image that... Um, the wife, Beatrice, comes out with at one point. She, she wonders if it's like when you shelter under a tree in a, in a, in a rainstorm and the, and the actual rain has stopped, but, the, but you don't realize because the, the rain is still dripping from the branches above you. She wonders if the love they feel for each other now is, is rather like that situation. If, if you've had the shared memories cut off, maybe the love is just doomed to just die sooner or later. And so, she, so th this is partly why they set off um, across the countryside to try and find, um, find these lost memories. They think they're looking for their lost son. They've got the vague idea that they had a son, something happened to that son. The son isn't living with them anymore. They think if they find that son somewhere, living in some village somewhere, a lot of the lo lost memories have come back to them. But, uh, but maybe it's some of you are identify with this situation. Um, like any two people in a long marriage, I mean, 
they start to fear after a while if, if certain passages from their, dark passages from their marriage um, that they have successfully managed to kind of bury, if that starts to come back as well, um, is, that going to, is that going to damage their love? I mean, will their love survive remembering everything? That starts to become a fear. So the, so the same question applies to a relationship uh, as, as the one I articulated for a society. When is it better to remember? When is it better to forget? Do we sometimes need to just agree to forget? So memory is one of the guiding themes of the book, and it also seems to establish the narrative in a way in terms of how the narrative moves forward and backward. And it seems that in when you're telling the story, it's a constant series of rememberings. It's not a straight through line to the end. And is this a narrative structure that you created because of the, the memory issues in the book and what you're trying to say politically and personally? Or is it just, this is the way you write? I think it's more just the way I write. I mean, I, I, think, I think I've just got into the habit, because I've been writing about memory and through memory all through my career, I've got into a bit of a, I sometimes worry that you know, it's, it's become a kind of a, a, a habit or a laziness on my part. Um, I find it very difficult not to tell a story in, uh, through, through kind of a person's memories. And so even when I'm telling something that's like, like a large, largely a third person road movie type of story, I find myself instead of just kind of unfolding the thing in, in kind of real time, uh, I have to keep kind of jumping ahead so that, so that the, the character can then remember back, you know. This is probably kind of un unnecessarily baffling um, to, so, <laughs> and irritating to, to read, I guess, you know. Um, you know. Why can't we have this episode and this episode and this episode? But, but it, I, I, do, I find a certain richness in being able to do that. So, so suddenly you're, you're plunged into some new context altogether, I guess, and you, you're probably thinking, well, how the hell did we get here? And then gradually the, the characters re, you know, remember back, so you fill the gap. You know. um, so it, that's what you're referring to, are you, are this kind of slightly perverse yeah. way to, to tell them what, what should be a straightforward story. I wasn't story. going to call it perverse. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess, I, I suppose, I, I just think that, that there are little richnesses that you can find as a, as, a, as a writer, and I hope as a reader, you know, when you tell a story like that, because the, you're con you're, the constantly you're in the situation where, where the, the character who, is, who, who, who has the viewpoint is, is assessing and evaluating uh, what has happened. You know, it's, it's not just a neutral kind of this happened, it's somebody saying, well, th I think this happened, to, this is what we just did, but what do I think of that? You know, um, I wasn't very comfortable with that, or maybe it's just as well that happened. You know, it, everything, there's a kind of a, it, there's an evaluation process going on all the time about, about the events that way. You know, so it's, not, it's much more than just the telling of what happened. Right. So that, I guess that's why I've, I've kind of locked myself into this mm -hmm. habit. You know. Well, as a structure, it, it's also much more engaging for the reader. It requires that you pay greater attention to what's unfolding before you. Yeah, th this assumes it's, it's good to, to, to try and make the reader work Yeah, you work keep harder. us on our toes. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this love that Beatrice and Axel have for one another is so utterly charming and involving and beautiful. And yet, like you say, it, it, it has these dark places in it. Um, and love also seems to be a topic that you write about in many of your books. And in most of the books, it's pretty tragic. Um, it's unrequited, it's, it's disastrous. Is, can, is, is there a place for happy contemporary love in literature? <laughs> <laughs> or love in contemporary literature that's not tragic? Well, I, I, I think, I mean, all right, uh, you're, all right you're, it's fair enough, that accusation. <laughs> but, but I, I would, you know, in mitigation, I would say that I, you know, I have made some small improvements <laughs> in my kind of optimism. I mean, right, when I was writing The Remains of the Day, you know, if you're just looking at it as a love story, that, that, that's, 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 a, you know, that's a real downer. Yeah, I mean, they, I they don't, that's... They don't even, you know, they love each other, they don't, they don't even declare their love for each right. other. They just say, 
you know, in old, old age, they say goodbye to each other and they've never even told each other that they love each other. All right, that, that's pretty bad. All right, so it's very sad. Uh, but, you know, my subject then was you know, the fear of, fear of the emotions and, and the wasted life, you know. Um, I think as I've kind of got older, um, I think I've cheered up a little bit about... <laughs> about like, so I, think, I think a book like Never Let Me Go, my, my previous novel, it's... Or, or it, has some, it has some kind of sad aspects to it. I, 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 I accept that, but, but, but essentially, you're just talking about the, 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 you know, the, the, the characters' love for each other. Yeah, I'm being reductive here. Yeah, I think, I think it's a very positive, cheerful novel. I mean, basically, basically, yes, you know, they are very conscious of their mortality. They're co conscious of the aging process. Um, Basically, they're, they're young people who are going through the experience of old people in that right. book. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think I start, around that time, I, started, I started to think I want to celebrate the good, decent things about human nature, despite the, the inevitably sad backdrop that is part of the human existence that we just cannot get away from, which is really aging, you know, getting sick, dying, and I suppose, for lovers, inevitable separation. I wanted, to, I wanted to celebrate the characters themselves. I wanted to say, actually, you know, there's a lot of good, decent things about people. And when they know their time is short, and what, what becomes important to, to people? In, in, Never, in Never Let Me Go, I wanted to suggest that things like, indeed, making sure that someone you loved all your life knows it, you know, that, that, which is what, what happens with Tommy and Kathy. And, that, and, and, and if you've done something wrong um, towards someone close to you, that you want to put that right before it's too late, and um, the need to forgive somebody before it's too late. I mean, these things become paramount to the characters in Never Let Me Go. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, I guess the sad thing is that they just want a little bit more time together, the two people who love each other, and, and they sentimentally believe that they might be allowed to do this. You know, the, 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 but nevertheless, you know, I think my view of love and people being able to come together and the ability to care for each other is, is a very positive one, I, I would say. It's an optimistic one. And in this book, too, you know, it's, I, think, I think my view of a, a kind of a, a long-distance marriage, you know, what I mean is you know, a marriage that goes over Hopefully many, not. many years, yeah, you know, um, it, it is um, essentially an optimistic one about, about people. Of course, it there's an ine inevitable danger or fear about or separation. But, I mean, that comes, with th that comes with the very fact that, you know, the bond is a precious one. I mean, um, you know, then, you know, if it's precious, then the fear of losing it is, you know, becomes, becomes something <coughs> very large. I, guess, I mean, when we talk about love stories, we usually talk about courtship stories, really. You know, most love stories about how two people come together, and, and often the story ends when they come together. Um, you know, you have, you have these kind of, um, I suppose you have stories about people, marriages falling apart, but I'm not sure whether you call them love stories. But, but I kind of think there should be more love stories that, that are actually about, you know, what happens after the people have declared their love for each other. Because after all, that's what to me, that's, that's what love really is. It's, it's, it's about you know, what happens after that. It's about, it's about the, the long distance you have to travel together, where you have to, where you have to battle to keep that flame alive you know, against all the, thing, all the changes, all the things that, all the bad weather that, that you know, threatens to blow the thing, thing out. And, and so this is a love story in that sense. It's, a, it's about a couple who, who are determined to stand by each other right to the end. You know. right. um, but this big question haunts them. You know, how much do we want to remember about the darker? Inevitably, everyone has you know, something, whether it's anyone's fault or not. You know, that there are maybe things that, at some stage, you think, well, it's better to just, just leave that and, and, and move on. But I guess when, when, you, when a couple start to sense the time together perhaps isn't long now, Maybe it becomes that question becomes very urgent. You know, do we want to look at everything? Because if we keep some things completely hidden and buried about our past, does it mean our love is phony? Is it real? Is it based on some some kind of illusion? 
Um, so th this is the question that haunts them th throughout the book because of you know because this mist has conveniently taken away right. a lot of their memories. So do they want them back or do they not? You know? And they well, I'm not. Gonna well, say no, no, no spoilers, please. <laughs> <Yeah>. no. <laughs> Maybe we can switch to a lighter topic. Um, <laughs> in in this book, you are grappling with God in a way that I haven't seen in some of the earlier books. This is your you light topic? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was being facetious. <laughs> oh, I see. I was, I was uh, sorry, I was hoping that you read. Oh, right, okay, carry on, sorry. <laughs> no, but I mean, it, it, this is a book in which you grapple with God, which I haven't noticed, or, mm -hmm. and maybe I just didn't notice in some of the earlier works. But Father Jonas and Whiston going at it, um, these discussions about mercy and the Christian God and forgiveness, and I'm wondering if this is something that grew out of the setting between the Saxons and the Britons in, in the early Iron Age and in the early Christian Age, or if it's now a topic that you are like a long relationship considering. I don't know. I, I hadn't, you're right. I hadn't really, uh, I haven't had kind of theological or religious um, discussion in my previous books. Um, but I, I've almost stumbled across this. I've always been interested in these kind of questions outside of my writing, I think. But um, when I was writing this book, of, you know, I chose this setting for the kind of reasons I was explaining before. And I ended up with a period when the, you know, the Britain was, was occupied by um, a, an indigenous Christian people, uh, the Britons, who had inherited Christianity from the Romans, because uh, you know, they'd been under the Roman Empire. And the invading Anglo-Saxons from the European mainland, either people who later become the English and who established the English language and so on, they at that time were pagans. And, and so inevitably in, in, in setting my story in this time, one of the, one of the, one of the cultural differences between the, the two tribes who are kind of uneasily coexisting was, I suppose, a religious one, or at least an ethical one. And I guess there is a suggestion, an accusation on the part of the pagan Anglo-Saxons that there is something, uh, there is something peculiarly convenient about the Christian doctrine of, uh, of an infinitely merciful God. That's very convenient. This is what Whiston says. It's very convenient for a, for a, a bunch of people who, who, who've committed terrible atrocities. Um, to believe in an infinitely merciful God. Um, he's saying, you know, we're, our pagan gods, you know, you break the rules, you, you, you get punished. You know, that, um, that, 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 that's how it is. But you know, what, what is this Christian God that you have? You think you can do all kinds of things. Does it give you license to, it, does it make it easier for you to do terrible things if you think all you have to do is just pray and maybe commit acts of piety, you know, a few self-inflicted wounds, and, uh, and, and beg for God's forgiveness. I mean, you have a God that says he will always forgive you. I mean, there's, surely there's something wrong with that. This is what, this, that's the pagan viewpoint that he expresses. And I suppose maybe that I have sometimes wondered um, if it isn't indeed, if, if, it's, if it's, you know, just a coincidence or what, that actually the, the countries that built all these empires all around the world, you know, that, that went around sort of capturing slaves in Africa and uh, raiding people's countries, and what, uh, they tended to all be the Christian ones. You know, um, and, and perhaps it was easier for them to, to kind of think that they would be forgiven. Um, um, yeah, it's an interesting, it is an interesting question, which I, I wouldn't mind exploring further. If, 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 if um, indeed, if for all the virtues that come out of the Judeo-Christian tradition, I think there are many great things that, that have been built on that. And, and you could argue that, you know, liberal demo democracy and all these things have been built out of those values. But is there something dangerous about that idea that you can always get forgiven? You know, it, no matter what you do. Now, does that make it easier to do pretty bad things? Well, and to your credit, the novel sort of lets both perspectives live. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't take sides either on, right. on that question or, or when, when it's better to, you know, how much is better to remember and forget. Mm. 
How did you come up with the narrator? Um, in your earlier books, it's a first person narrator. In this one, I noticed it's almost um, the narration. It's sort of, it's kind of a, he's a, or she is a wry narrator. They're, they're, they're traversing time in a way. And it seems more akin to what you might find in an epic poem or something like that rather than a contemporary first person narrative. Yeah, I, well, the, yeah, well, I, I guess, you know, in my earlier books, I was really concerned about memory, remembering, you know, assessing one's life uh, at, the, at the purely individual level. This is why I, I almost always chose, you know, first person without hesitation, because I had to be able to follow just one person's thoughts and, you know, the, follow their labyrinthine thoughts and memories as they try to look at how their lives had gone and, and assessed and reassessed and hid from themselves and then try to be frank with themselves. So I, I needed the whole universe of the novel to be inside one person's head. So it, no context, it's always first person. Here, as I've, as I've been explaining, I, I wanted to move on from just individual memory to societal memory, to you know, how a nation remembers and forgets. So I, I, I thought I would need several viewpoints uh, otherwise, the whole thing will become dominated just by you know one character and and his his and probably you know Axel's personal struggles with his memory and it it would, it would end up being like you know never let me go or remains the day it would essentially be about one person's struggles with his personal thing and it, it won't it wouldn't spread out to the to the wider community and it wouldn't essentially on the other hand be about a marriage you know the shared memories of a marriage rather you know, it would just end up as an individual so. I did think, um, move away from, let's move away from first person. Having said that, I mean, it's a bit messy, my use of the first person in this book. It's, it's, um, I, th that opening passage I read out, you know, there was this eye figure. I just thought it would be kind of friendly to have a kind of a tour guide, because we're going into a kind of a very strange world, or, you know, ancient world. I, I just thought, um, rather than do the kind of William Gibson thing of kind of dropping people in some kind of really strange world, kind of complete full immersion stuff so that for about the first 60 pages you don't understand anything. <laughs> and then you slowly start to kind of piece together what, what you know, certain things mean, what certain objects do, you know, what, what certain things refer to. Um, I mean, that, that, that's one way to do it, you know. But, but I, I, I just thought I'd make it easy for the reader. I have this kind of Talk, a kind of intermediary voice, They're saying, you know, you would have found this rather surprising. I mean, you know, there was this, and this is how they used to. Um, and uh, I, I thought it would be, you know, I could kind of phase this voice out slightly, and uh, as we went on, you know, as people became more comfortable with the environment, and I, I would allow certain characters' viewpoints to to then tell the story. Um, and and it's 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 a little bit kind of. Uh, uh, ragged, I would say, my, my use of the first person in this book. But I'll, I'll tell you, I mean, it, th this is something that um, you can be absolutely forgiven for not having spotted, um, because I had this, well, I thought was quite, a, quite an interesting idea uh, when I was writing this book about the first person narrator. And I, as I went on, I thought, actually, this is too dark, or this is just too much to handle. So I really played back this idea. But it's still there if you actually look for it. I had this idea that, um, well, uh, in, in most of my first-person narratives, there's a you. You know, the, the narrator says, you know, I, but there's an actual you um, in the books. You know, Mr. Stevens, the butler, addresses a you. But it's not you, the reader. It's, in the case of The Remains of the Day, it's another servant. He can't imagine the you being anything other than somebody in his little world. You know, the same with Kathy in Never Let Me Go. This, this person, he or she, keep saying you as well. Um, my idea was that this time the you should be an audience of slaughtered innocent children, the ones that have been slaughtered throughout history. And I gradually wanted to, to raise the curtain on that possibility as we went through. Um, and and, the, and the re the, it, it remains, but it's kind of submerged. But there's, towards the end, there's an example of... We're towards the end because I've read it twice and I missed it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm not the closest reader, I will say. That's why I had to read it twice. Ah, I've opened it up straight away. It says, ah. 
Thank you, and Chapter good night. 15 begins like this. This is the you, right? Some of you would have fine monuments by which the living may remember the evil done to you. Some of you would have only crude wooden crosses or painted rocks, while yet others of you must remain hidden in the shadows of history. You are in any case part of an ancient procession, and so it is always possible the giant's cairn was erected to mark the site of some tragedy long ago when young innocents were slaughtered in war. And it just moves on then to talking about this particular landmark, and then we just drift back into the, right. into the narrative. But I had a, you can be perfectly forgiven for not having spotted oh, I even, that. You know, I, I wrote it down. Oh, yeah. I so just it's, forgot. Well, what did you write? Well, what the heck is this? Narr <laughs> narrator. <laughs> yeah, I sort of missed the point, but I wrote no, it down. No, there's no point. There's no point. It's a kind of... It's a kind of messy thing that, you know, when a, when a writer like me kind of has, a, has something, you know, I, I, I thought I had a bright idea there. And I had a, whole, <laughs> I had a kind of thread that ran all the way through it. Um, you know, that I that you hear and that you, I mean, after a while the reader is supposed to start wondering, well, who is this you? you know, exactly the same as in my previous books. You know, people start to think, well, who is the you then? You know, because... I, as the reader, I'm kind of eavesdropping. This, this, is, this you isn't addressed to me. I'm kind of eavesdropping on a conversation between the narrator and some, some other person. You know? And I wanted that effect this time. And I, I wanted to slowly pull back the curtain. Uh, and, and here we have a situation where, where some sort of disembodied narrator is narrating to an audience of ghosts, you know, young, innocent people who've been slaughtered throughout history, innocently, because that's essentially a you know, large part of what this is about. But um, A, I thought that was kind of hard to pull off, and B, B I just thought things were going to get too dark. too dark, yeah, at that point, you know, and it would distract from the main story. So I really, really underplayed it. Um, but if someone's looking for that, if someone starts to ask, you know, who, who is the you in this book, and they, they, they think about it hard enough, I think you know, passages like the one I just read out would, would actually... Point to, point, to the, point to it. I took out a few other little things that used to be there. I didn't think about it hard enough. Before we throw it open to the audience and involve them, I want to ask you one question about something that I saw that really surprised me, that you were a, a grouse um, rouster at Balmoral Castle. Did I make that up? No, that, that was my um, first job um, uh, between How school and university. How did you get that university. job? Well, what actually, I, I worked for the Queen Mother, you know, the mother of Queen Elizabeth uh, in England. Um, it's, it's, it's just a job you have for uh, four weeks because the grouse shooting season in Scotland is just four weeks. You're only allowed to shoot this bird for four, four weeks in the year. Okay. And it's, a, it's, an it's, a, it's almost strictly an aristocra <coughs> aristocratic sport, you know. Um, um, uh, so people like the Queen Mother would invite guests and um, yeah, they, they, they hang around gum butts on the Scottish moors uh, with, with kind of shotguns and, 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 uh, and they, they drink a lot of whiskey and, <laughs> and they wait for um, uh, people like me, the grouse beaters, usually kind of young student types. Um, in the old days, they used to be kind of like permanently employed people who ran the land. But these days, it's kind of student types. You, you kind of line up in, a f in formation, maybe about 100 yards apart, maybe about two miles, or maybe a mile away from the gum butts, and you converge on the gum butts. You have to walk across the moors in formation regardless of what is there. You know, if there's a, a thorny bush there, you've got to keep in line and walk straight through it. It's, it's really tough stuff. You know. Otherwise, some kind of psychotic Scottish ghillie up on the cliff starts to scream <laughs> at you because you've, got out, you know, you've broken the line. And the idea is that all the birds in, in the moor uh, keep hearing your footsteps and they jump forward and they, they accumulate at the gum butts and, uh, and where they fly up into the air. And, and these drunken aristocrats kind of, you know, <laughs> they fire away and, uh, and shoot as many birds as possible and, and maybe a few of us. You know, that, 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 that's <laughs> that, 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 that's basically, that's basically you know, what grouse beating is. In fact, there's a pretty interesting novel by an, uh, a British novelist called Isabel Colgate called The Shooting Party. Oh, I don't yeah, know, yeah. Do you know that? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. It was made into a movie as well. I've seen the yeah. movie. Mm -hmm. I yeah. <laughs> that's, that's about, you know, that's about um, a grouse shoot that kind of gets out of hand. You know. 
<laughs> I'm glad yours didn't. So why don't we throw it open for questions? A, an English novelist that I'm very interested in, I, I don't know if you're familiar with him or not, John Cooper Poes, wrote a book, a novel called Porius, uh, set in a period very much like yours, the, uh, the Dark Ages, the period when the Romans had disappeared and you had all these various tribes fighting each other. Uh, he said he thought it was important to, to, or a good period to write about because very little history was there, so you could imagine almost anything you wanted to, which he proceeded to do. Uh, and, and maybe this was something that you wanted to do also. I'm just curious, though, as to why in this novel uh, you felt it necessary to uh, give us uh, uh, she-dragons and uh, pixies and... Uh, 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 ogres and so forth. Um, uh, yeah, this wasn't a. Yeah, it is set in a kind of a, a, a mysterious historical period, as, as, as you very clearly outlined. I mean, no historian agrees, you know, um, really about what happened. Um, uh, you know, between the time the Romans left around 410 A.D. and the time the Anglo-Saxons settled Britain and the place started to become England in around 490. AD. Um, were there ogres and pixies and dragons around at the time? Well, I, I, I'm not sure. Probably not. <laughs> but you, you think so? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think maybe there were because I mean, he, he, I, I, for instance, I, I read this. Um, he, he, many of you here might have read this poem, you know, the famous poem by anonymous poet uh, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Okay. Um, now. Most of that poem has nothing to do with my book, um, you know, because most of it takes place in castles, and it's, it's a great story, but it, it has little to do with my book. But one bit that does, there's a, literally something like a bridge passage when the young Gawain goes from one castle, Camelot, to the, um, and he has to ride across Britain and go to um, the Green Knight's castle, and the story continues. But there's, there's a, about a stanza, it's just a little stanza that, describes what Britain was like at that time. Um, and so, um, yeah, I took this as a kind of piece of research, I suppose. And it says, you know, Britain was a terrible place in those days. You know, there were no inns or anything like this for, for this young man to shelter in. He had to sleep on rocks in the pouring rain. I, I don't know why he would sleep on rocks. Why, why not under a tree? But anyway, that's what it says. <laughs> he had to kind of cling on to rocks. And, and it says that, you know, he was often chased out of villages by wolves, wild boars, or by panting ogres that you know, came after him up hills. That's, that's what it says. You know. And I, I, I rather, that was one of those moments when I was looking, when I was location hunting, and I thought, oh yeah, this is what I want. I really like the fact that the, the panting ogres are, 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 are kind of in there without any real sense of surprise. You know. <laughs> the poet doesn't come back to them. It's just kind of really banal fact. It's, it's like, you know, to unfriendly bulls in the field or something. And, and so it really sparked my imagination. And so the rule of thumb I went by, to, to answer the gentleman's question, the rule of thumb I went by in creating my world was if somebody of that time could reasonably hold, or we would call it a superstitious belief, but you know, a belief in that pre-scientific time that there were such you know, supernatural forces um, out there in, in this kind of untamed wilderness. And it's, uh, then, then I would allow it to exist literally in, in the world of my fiction. That, that, that was my rule. Because I needed, I needed these things. I needed ogres, particularly the pixies. They're, they're, they're only in it in a kind of a background way. They're kind of extras. They're not very prominent. But I very much needed them to do very serious things. I mean, it, se it seems to me that in that kind of society, before scientific explanations were around. Supposing somebody close to you, you realize has got ill, maybe seriously ill, and you want an explanation, it doesn't seem unreasonable to, to, to say to yourself, well, actually, now I remember thinking back, maybe you know, two months ago, there was something moving about in the darkness of our room at night when we were asleep. And I, I thought then it was some kind of sprite or a pixie. And I think it was. And, I, and, and that, that creature brought this illness and gave it to my wife. It, it seems to me that that's not an unreasonable belief to hold in a, 
pre-scientific age. And in an emotional sense, in a human sense, that pixie is something real and important. Um, and so in my book, when, when these creatures are around, they, they stand for something, they stand for real things, they stand for important things. Um, I, I, I needed them, you know. And, and I know that some people, um, I've heard some people say to me, you know, um, oh, I, I really love the you know, Remains of the Day or whatever, but I hear your latest book has got uh, pixies and ogres. <laughs> and I, I don't usually read books with you know, creatures like that in it. And, uh, um, I, I, you know, I, ki I kind of want to say to them, well, you know, don't try not to be prejudiced about it, you know, because I think, you know, um, I needed those guys in my in my book. You know, they, they, they are just extras. You know, I didn't I didn't pay them very well, <laughs> you know, but I feel they did a really good job for me when I needed them. Eh? And now I'm going to stand by them. You know, um, I I think they're good in my book. And uh, you know, uh, if you come into my world, I mean, uh, you, you, you may find that uh, uh, you understand why they're there. You know, they're there for very important reasons artistically. Yeah, I think for me, part of the pleasure of reading it was just sort of slowly immersing myself in that world and then just going with the flow of the narrative. I do understand that you know, some people might um, be put off by the news that, that a, you know, a book has got these things in. Because I have to admit, I don't really read many books um, that, that might be classified as fantasy in, in, in the contemporary sense. Although I do like to read a lot of things like um, The Odyssey and the Iliad, and um, indeed the poems of Gawain and the Green Knight and Beowulf. I, mean, um, I like things like that a lot. You know, I like ancient folk tales. Um, you know, I like old samurai stories that I, I, you know, I was brought, brought up on as a kid, where, where you know, the demons and things like that are just there. Uh, um, and it seems they seem to me to be very powerful devices and tropes that have been used throughout the history of Storytelling, from, uh, you know, from the time when people first started to tell stories around the fire, I'm sure those kinds of things were there. Um, and I, I think right now is quite an interesting time. Um, certainly, I, I feel it living in Britain, in, in the world of books. I mean, the, the, the parameters of the traditional parameters of what counts as literary fiction or kind of mainstream fiction are, are changing and shifting. And I think the barriers between genres are also kind of breaking down. If something, I, and it, I think probably a generation of readers brought up on Harry Potter and uh, uh, who loved Harry Potter and for whom Harry Potter was a really exciting thing that happened throughout their growing up. I mean, some of those people have, are, are now very serious readers of classics, you know, avant-garde literature. But, but you know, they, they remember this tremendous love they have for, for a fantasy world, you know, Philip Pullman. You know, we had some writers of great quality appear in the 1990s in, um, uh, for, for kind of children. Um, and I think that's possibly had a, it's now coming through as, as the, that generation are now in their 20s. And I feel there's a lot of very exciting writing going on at the moment on the part of writers younger than me, you know, um, very freely moving between what used to be called popular and literary, moving between genres very freely. You know, the, the, rule, the rule seems to be if, if, it, if you can use it and it's, it's going to make a better book, use it, you know, without prejudice, you know, without stigma. And I, I, think it's, it, I think it's a very exciting time. And, and somebody, an older writer like me, I, I, I feel I'm getting the benefits of that. I, I'm feeling more liberated to the extent that I, c I can kind of write a, a book that might just about be called a fantasy book or... Never Let Me Go could be called a sci-fi book. I think possibly a little bit earlier than that, I would have been afraid mm. to, to use those kinds of devices. But you don't think of them, you don't think of it in your writing as genre writing. It's what the story demands. And so the device is there for you to use. Yeah, I, I, I'm usually too desperate. <laughs> when, when I'm trying to write a story, I, 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 I have so much difficulty getting it to work. You know. And I, it's the last thing I'm worried about is what genre I'm going to end up in. Right. I, I'm, like, um, I'm like someone trying to, you know, I'm like somebody in the 19th century, early 19th century, trying to build a flying machine. You know, I need it to fly, you know, you, you know the way they built these kind of weird looking kind of bird-like things with bits sticking out. I mean, that, that, that's what I do when I'm writing a novel, you know. I, mean, um, I just need it to fly, and it won't fly. And I get 
I get quite kind of panic-stricken at times. And then I think, oh, this would work, you know. Um, uh, and it's only later on, I, I, I guess, you know, when I'm flapping about in this strange thing that uh, it occurs to me what it must look like from the outside. <laughs> 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 and it's, it's kind of like that with genre. I mean, it's probably naive of me, but, you know, uh, you know I, I published Never Let Me Go, and people say, oh, it's a sci-fi novel, isn't it? Oh, I thought, oh, is it? Oh, I suppose so. Um, and with this, I mean, uh, you know, the people say, well, it's, it's a fantasy novel because they're, they're kind of pixies in it. Hi, uh, you're talking about kind of the uh, sad outlook of your novels and how that, that's changed. And it was interesting, the, my first um, contact with your work was actually seeing the movie of uh, The Remains of the Day. And when I got around to reading the book, I was actually really struck by how funny it was. Because I, I was expecting it to be really somber, like like the uh, the movie, and uh, and there is you know so much humor in it. Um, and then you know you, in your most recent novel, there's not not nearly as much, but you know but you bring in Gawain, who who seems almost like Don Quixote at times, and you have him, he's talking to his horse all the time. Um, so uh, how how does humor fit in? Well, I, I'm, I'm really gratified to hear that because I, I, I just think I'm, I'm a much funnier writer than people give me credit for. I mean, <laughs> everyone thinks I'm a, you know, a real misery, you know. And you're right. I think The Remains of the Day, I, I wrote it as a comedy. All right, it's a sad comedy. But, you know, I, I thought there was something very funny about a guy who didn't have a sense of humor. <laughs> you know, and, and a lot of the humor comes out of that. Um, you're right. The, the movie doesn't really... Play on that. Uh, yeah, I think it's an absolutely superb movie. That, that you know, um, but um, actually, recently John Cleese published his autobiography. Um, some of you may have read it, and uh, he reveals. I, I don't know if he actually reveals in the book or if he just revealed in some interviews, but it, it made a lot of headlines. Um, he revealed, you know, quite recently that he he was offered the part of Stevens the butler for the movie, and and I, I I've always known that he was the first choice. Um, in the sense that, you know, not the preferred choice, but he was the first person um, who was approached. And I guess part of the thinking behind that was that, yeah, the, the book was quite comic. It's a sad comedy. And that giving John Cleese you know, um, that role um, would have brought that out. But the, uh, the film that was made, you know, kind of slipped into a slightly different genre, I guess, and it, like, like a, you know, a, a real kind of classic period you know, costume kind of drama, and it's it's one of the very best films of that kind of genre, I think. And so, I mean, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't um, ask for anything more of that film because the and the and the performance by Anthony Hopkins is just staggering. Because I uh, we we went, we did a little screening of it last week in Toronto, uh, at which I you know I, I I kind of introduced it with another person, and I, I was reminded what a superb film that was. Um, so. Yeah, so uh, in a way, you know, I, I'm, I'm pleased when people pick up on the humour, but humour is such a difficult thing. If people don't get it, they don't get it, you know. Um, and I, um, I think, yeah, Gaw Sir Gawain, you know, uh, the ageing old knight, you know, Sir Gawain, is, yes, he, he's, he's intended to be tragic and comic. Um, yeah, I mean, you say Don Quixote, yeah. I, I was thinking a little bit of, you know, Walter Brennan, you know. <laughs> He was, a, he was a bit like kind of Walter Brennan crossed with... I mean, if, if you can imagine Walter Brennan in one, of, in one of those kind of big John Wayne parts, you know, kind of <laughs> like, like in The Searchers, you know, some kind of aging gunfighter who, who's out of time. You know, a man of violence, his era is over, and he knows it, but he, he can't live in any other way, so you have a lonely figure on a horse, you know, under a big sky, except, you know, it's not John Wayne playing the character, it's Walter Brennan playing the character. <laughs> It's kind of, I kind of thought of it a bit like that, you know. Hello over here. Uh, my wife and I are both teachers, and it occurs to me, as a friend of mine just finished reading Never Let Me Go yesterday, we're discussing it. Uh, I wanted to ask why you decided to use a school in such a diabolical way. <laughs> and, by, and by that I mean while they were trying to prove to others the, 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 what, who the students were, they also were conditioning them to fulfill their purpose. I suppose the school, yeah, the school, it, it, it wasn't a comment on any school system or anything like that. <laughs> um, but I thought, 
He said, I, I, I always had this idea that um, any of us, whether, whether we're, we're, most of us as parents, whether we're talking about in a, in a school setting or just, just in, a, in a home setting, there's something about bringing up children um, where you are kind of obliged to keep them in a kind of a, a sheltered bubble. You do have to lie to children when they're young about how unpleasant the real world is. I, th I think it's correct to, to deceive them to some extent. It, and actually, I think this is something that everyone instinctively <coughs> understands. You know, if you walk around the streets w with a, with a five-year-old or a four-year-old, you know, everybody you encounter, strangers, whatever, enter into a conspiracy. You know, they, they, they all suddenly smile at the child. And if they're having a quarrel, they stop. And they, everyone enters into this conspiracy with you. To, to fool this kid into thinking that the world is, is much nicer than it actually is. <laughs> and I think that is only right. Uh, it, it's tragic when a child doesn't have that protective bubble. And as, they, as the ch children get older, I suppose we kind of, as adults and parents, we just drop little bits of the bad news in, you know, <laughs> into this little bubble and see, uh, see what they do with it. You know? But we, we, we like to keep this bubble around them until they're strong enough to step out of that bubble, you know. And I guess in, in Never Let Me Go, rather than that metaphor I just came out with a bubble, I, I made it concrete. You know, it's, it's actually a school. It's an actual place. And, and, and they're cut off from everybody else. The big, dark thing about their fate, um, they, they're, they're kept from the horrors of it. But as they get older, the, the people in that school, if you like, do, do I think what we all do with kids, they, they, they drip feed the bad news so that they, they never kind of receive it in a traumatic way. It, rather like the way we gradually let kids know about death or anything else bad. You know. They kind of know it and they don't know it. You know. And, and there's this very careful control of the way kids kind of know, get to know that their, their fate is to be organ donors and that they'll die young. You know. They kind of accept it, and, and they don't think it's a big deal, because they they're, given, they're given the news and always a little bit too early, so that it doesn't do too much to them. And, and, and they think, oh, it's something way, way off anyway. And, and they, they kind of grow up knowing things and not knowing things. So, so the school was, for me, a kind of a concrete, a very concrete uh, kind of metaphor, if you like, or an embodiment of what I think... Um, is the process that children go through anyway, when they learn the kind of the big bad news about mortality and the, and, 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 and the harshness of, of the world out there. Hi there. Um, on Hi. a more lighthearted note, um, and just more of a curious note, I'd heard in another interview that you used to be a musician before you were a novelist. Have you ever gone back to music or even done anything in that vein? Um, well, I, I, I'm a, I, I, I write song lyrics for the jazz singer Stacey Kent. I've been doing that regularly since 2007. Um, I don't write the music. Uh, her husband and band leader and saxophonist Jim Tomlinson writes the music, but uh, um, if, you, if you check out Stacey Kent's albums, um, fr from the 2007 album that was nominated for a Grammy Award, actually, for Best Jazz Vocal Album, I mean, I I've contributed songs. Um, and that is actually a very good fun for me um, because I always wanted to be a songwriter. I mean, in fact, I was a, a bad songwriter when I was young. You know. <laughs> in fact, I was a very bad singer-songwriter. <laughs> I think it's the singer bit that, that, that ensured you know, failure for me. But, but um, I've always loved songs. Um, I, I've loved the way you know, a, a, a miniature world can be created just in like a three- or four-minute song. You know, the, and I think m many of the um, things I learned as a writer, I learnt, uh, first of all, as a songwriter, you know, because I, I kind of went from writing songs to writing short fiction to writing my first novel in, in just a very few number of years. And so uh, a lot of my apprenticeship as a writer of fiction uh, was in writing songs. And I think, I think we were, you were talking about first-person narrative before, and my fondness for the first person. That, that's kind of a hangover, you know, because somewhere I, I think of novels uh, uh, like you know, just just one person with an acoustic guitar in, in some in some kind of little club with maybe about seventeen 
people late at night listening, uh, and this person is kind of intimately uh, relating some, some, some emotion or feeling uh, through a song. Um, you know, so I, I think I like the first person for that kind of reason. And, and the way I use first person has a lot to do with the, w the way a singer might sing a song, an you know, intimate song. Even the way I, I prefer the lyrics to be, to, to kind of a bit, a bit a little coy with direct meaning. You know, that's something that's very natural in a song because you have to, you have very few words in a song. You have to push the, push the, um, the meaning in between the lines or under the lines um, to leave it plenty of space for the performance and the music to, to create the emotion. You know, to, so I think all of these things I, I learned a lot, and I still think a little bit like a songwriter when I'm, when I'm writing a book. And, and, and just one other thing I'd add about music. I, I think it's really, I find, uh, particularly as I get older, I think it's very important for me, and maybe for other writers like me, to, to keep in touch with that more intuitive way of making artistic decisions that musicians have, or maybe also painters perhaps have. I don't know much about painting, but... But the trouble with writing fiction, because you use words, and that's the same thing that is used when you express a, a, a closely argue, argued, uh, when you do a closely argued essay or a polemic, or you know, when you're trying to argue a point. There's, a, there's often a temptation to kind of think you, everything you put in a novel it has to be something you can justify. Um, you, you can justify in a kind of a, lit kind of way, you know, um, that if you ask me, you know, why does that happen in a novel, I should be able to art articulate it, you know, in a very rational, logical way. But I think the truth of it is, I realize as I write more and more, many of the really important decisions in writing a novel are, are instinctive. Just like, it, it, I think the decisions have to be made in much the same way that, uh, say, a, saxoph a saxophonist says, you know, I prefer that take of my solo rather than that one because it, it's, it just sounds better. It's more beautiful to me. It's closer to what I want to express. You know, I can't justify it. You know, I can't give you a, any kind of theory or reason. You know, it's, it's obvious that's the take you use. You know. uh, and many, many decisions ab about writing fiction are like that. You know, why, why does that scene take place at dawn rather than in the middle of the day? Why does that person have three kids uh, um, uh, uh, instead of you know, being someone without a child. You know, what, a lot of these things, I mean, often you, you can't really drum up a, a good kind of rational reason for it, an intellectual reason for it. You just know that um, it, it, it sounds better that way. You know? and, and so I think, I think listening to music and to some extent playing music um, keeps, that side of, um, keeps that side of the creative process uh, lively and, and and in tune, and I think that's a really important thing because I sometimes think novelists can, can become far too in intellectual and self-conscious about why they do things. You know. Well, uh, unfortunately, we are out of time, so please oh, join sorry. me in thanking yeah. Kazuo Shigoro. <laughs> and we'll see you next day. Thank you so much. <laughs>